get started. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Welcome to Stanford CARE's monthly community health talk series. My name is Nitya Rajeshi and I will be your moderator tonight. I am pleased to bring you this series of talks co-sponsored by Stanford CARE, Stanford Health Library, and the Vincent V.C. Wu Memorial Foundation. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Rajesh Dash, who will speak on unraveling the heart disease epidemic, precision prevention strategies for high-risk South Asian patients. Thank you so much, Nithya. Um, uh, please let me know if you're hearing me clearly, but it is a, an honor and I really am thankful to uh, Stanford Health Libraries and, and the CARE organization for inviting me to speak tonight and thank you all for joining. Um, I am uh, really delighted to, to speak to all of you today about something that I've been working on and very passionate about uh, for most of my career at Stanford and I'll tell a little bit of the journey that we've gone through here at Stanford and, and the Sati Clinic to bring better preventive strategies for heart disease for the South Asian community here as well as abroad. This slide is uh, one that I've used for a long time because it does really encapsulate the South Asian patient here in the United States as well as even in India where we are really trying to fit uh, a square peg into a round hole so to speak in terms of our preventive strategies largely because the data that we've used across the world of cardiology has not been validated in our uh, ethnicity um, globally. And there's a, a dearth of data supporting what we do in this population, although that is starting to change now. So just quickly, some of my disclosures and, and uh, uh, sort of industry relationships I wanted to show here. But the bottom, I really do believe that, that prevention is the key for the world globally in this epidemic of, of heart disease that we are seeing in all industrialized countries. And we really need to become more precise in how we're achieving that prevention. Today I'm going to talk a bit about some of the myths around heart disease and highlight some of the key non-traditional risk factors for South Asian heart disease. I'm going to also then detail how the Sathi Clinic uh, is personalizing the cardiac care for those South Asians um, and how it's evolved starting starting within Sathi but also now expanding outside of Sathi to something called CardioClick where we've really tried to bring digital health into the equation to improve our outcomes. Uh, lastly, I want to highlight the NEST program, which is our nutrition uh, and lifestyle intervention program that pairs incredibly well with our medical program here at Sathi to really add tremendous value to our results. And it's really exciting what I think we've embarked upon here, and we have a long way to go, but I'm hoping to, to tell you more about it tonight and hear your feedback and questions. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I start with is, is the very first patient that we ever had in the Sathi clinic, and um, I've changed his name, uh, but um, we'll call him Samir tonight, and he at uh, that time was 44. He's now uh, giving away the, the punchline, but he is now f uh, 54, <laughs> um, and he is a father of two, had no history of heart disease when he first came to see me. Um, he wasn't really having any symptoms. Um, he was occasionally saying he got short of breath, but it wasn't really consistent. He was playing cricket. Uh, about three times a week, but if any of you have played cricket, it really does depend on what you're doing on that field. You may not be getting that much exercise, right? He was an occasional smoker uh, and had borderline high blood pressure, but otherwise his cholesterol profile on the surface looked fine, his basic lipid panel. And actually his primary care doctor was really aggressive and said, hey, you know, I've heard that South Asians have higher rates of heart disease I think you should go ahead and, and have an angiogram. And according to medical guidelines, he wasn't entirely wrong. Men over the age of 40 who have any sort of chest pain or chest pain equivalent might consider this option. But actually, the patient said, no, I'm not going to do that, and came into my clinic uh, to be seen and evaluated. Um, I looked at his family tree, and if any of you have done this before, this is a family pedigree. Uh, circles are females, squares are males here, and um, <clears throat> what? And he has two kids, of course. This was his wife. 
uh, and this is our patient here, he had actually come to me somewhat urgently because his brother, who was two years older, had actually just had a stent placed, a PCI is what we call that, for a, a heart-related blockage, right? And, um, and when we looked at his parents, uh, while his father had passed away from cancer, his mother had had four stents, and she was 70 years old, and three of her brothers had all died from heart attacks under the age of 60. So and this looks pretty severe, and it is um, really sobering to see that prevalence of heart disease, but it's actually a pretty common story in our clinic. Uh, he's high risk, and he's only 44. So I asked him to do the angiogram, and he said no. And so I said, okay, well, let's give you a sense of what your risk is. And this is the traditional cardiac risk score that's used all around the world. Uh, still used all around the world. And as you can see, the race designation is limited. White, African American, and other. I'll explain why in a moment. His risk, when we typed in all of his numbers, for a 10-year risk of events, which isn't that granular, it's a 10-year risk, it's hard to really make that impactful for patients, but it was actually on the low to moderate end, 4.9%. Now, common things being common, and heart disease being the number one killer, over a, a lifetime, his risk was high, but that's true of most patients, actually. But the 10-year risk was actually relatively low, and therefore, his recommendation was really not to be on any sort of cholesterol medication reduction, and he was deemed a low-risk patient. But if you looked in the in the bottom right-hand corner, there's actually a disclaimer, and it says that actually this risk score is, uh, it might underestimate the risk in South Asian patients. And uh, boy, is that true. It's actually missing approximately 70% of the heart disease risk in South Asians. It's really not accounting for many of the risk factors that we know make a big difference for South Asian patients. And yet this is the risk calculator that's available and used globally for all patients. And if you think about where it came from, it came from studying families living in Framingham, Massachusetts over the last 100 years. They've studied four generations and counting in that town, and most of the town is white or African American, and very few of the patients are of any other ethnicity. So as you might imagine, when you start adding in other ethnicities into this model, it stops losing its accuracy. So I said, listen, you're still high risk in my book, and we should evaluate you. If you're not going to do an angiogram, at least do something called a CT coronary angiogram, which gives you a 3D representation of the heart and re recreates the coronary blood vessels to look and see if they're open or not. Well, actually, he had very, very little calcium in his heart. His calcium score was actually 5. But when we, and that's very low, it's not totally normal. Normal would have been zero, but it was low. And when we actually did the CT coronary, we found that that calcium was connected to a very large chunk of non-calcified plaque, and he had a 99% blockage in the most important coronary vessel, his left anterior descending coronary vessel. And this was a critical blockage that affected 50% of his heart muscle. So he ended up getting a stent and I'm happy to say with medical management, he's doing well today, knock on wood. But um, this was our very first patient in Sathi Clinic. Now, if you look at this slide, and this isn't really set up for audience participation, but what does each person on this slide have in common? And I think many of you recognize some of the faces on this screen. Uh, all of these are Bollywood actors. Uh, or actresses. And the other thing that they have in common is that all of them have died during the years of 2017 to 2018 from sudden heart attacks. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see the age at which they died. And only Om Puri, uh, at the age of 67, had a heart attack event that wasn't considered to be a young event, meaning under the age of what we would consider to be a normal age range to have a heart attack. All of these other uh, individuals had heart attacks under that age cut off, which is pretty concerning. And so even pa patients who have access to potentially the best medical care are having cardiac events that are unexpected and early in life. 
Um, so this is pretty sobering. And, and actually today, we're doing a lot better with preventing deaths from heart attacks, both here as well as in India. In fact, one of my colleagues, Maha, um, that's what I call him, is Dr. Mahadevan, who used to run our emergency room medicine program, um, started the first sort of modern ambulance system in India and in Hyderabad at the GBK Ready system and brought what is now the largest ambulance system in the world into sort of the modern era with an amazing array of technologies and, and call center training. I uh, had the pleasure and honor to visit that center uh, with the Dean of Stanford Medicine um, to see it firsthand, but it really has made a huge difference all throughout India. This is happening now where we are doing better at protecting patients from dying from heart attacks. But the truth is they're still happening a lot. And so what you're seeing here are four Bollywood actors and actresses who in just a very recent time period, 2022 to 2023, also had heart attacks. They survived, but now they are living with the damage from their heart that they incurred. So this is really a huge problem. When we look at the global picture, 17 million patients, this is somewhat outdated, the numbers are higher now, but 17 million patients approximately 12, 13 years ago died from cardiovascular disease in India alone. Now, we're talking about a quarter of the world's population, but 60% of the world's heart disease. Some of the work published by our by CARE's own Dr. Palaniapan, uh, Letha's work in California showed that South Asians are having four times the rate of cardiac events, uh, and these events are happening 11 years earlier in life. So you would think that we should do better after that heart attack. We're younger, but actually we have a 40% higher mortality from that first heart attack, even though we are younger when it happens. So what's going on and how do we stem this bleeding, essentially, of major events happening at a much higher rate in a young South Asian population? Well, let's look at some little more data to, to prove that this is happening. Well, that traditional risk score that you saw um, we know that the rates of heart disease are much higher in South Asians but compared to other populations. But what are the risk scores showing? Well, as we just saw, the risk scores are almost identical when you calculate them. So the risk scores are terrible, basically, is what this is saying in predicting events in South Asians. Um, even if you use the more modern QRIS-3 model, which includes South Asian corrections, it's still not showing us that difference in actual event rates. It's still missing big chunks of the cardiovascular risk in our population. Similarly here, the observed rate versus the predicted rate is much higher in South Asians, but we're pretty darn good at predicting that in white patients. So we really do need much better models that are including maybe new types of risk factors. And that was really one of the major motivations for me to start the Sathi Clinic, um, because when you look across the landscape of the U.S., right now there are only two cardiology clinics in the U.S. that are dedicated to seeing only South Asian patients. And one is in a rural sort of urban, sort of suburban community rather in Illinois, uh, and the other is Sathi. And we need more of these. We need more centers that are really hitting the hot spots of where the South Asian patients are living and having their medical issues. Now, what are these risk factors that I'm talking about? What's the non-traditional risk that I'm speaking to? What we see here are three big buckets. And the first one you may have heard of before, which is insulin resistance and prediabetes. Uh, you've heard about diabetes, and that is definitely a risk factor for all patients, including South Asians. But prediabetes and insulin resistance are stepping stones to diabetes. And we are really seeing intermediate incremental risk of heart attack and stroke just from those stepping stones. So you don't even have to be diabetic to have risk. And the sad part is that most pre-diabetic patients don't know that they have it. And we see the same thing in our clinic. In fact, in our clinic, we test every patient for insulin resistance and pre-diabetes using a two-hour, four-time point blood test measuring insulin and glucose um, with a sugar solution that you drink. If you've uh, any women in the audience who have ever gone through pregnancy, you had a test like this, but this is more involved and it shows us that 70% of our patients have moderate to severe insulin resistance, and half of them already have prediabetes, and almost none of them actually knew it. 
when they went into that test. And the average age in our clinic is 42. So this is a very young population affected with a significant risk factor for heart disease. As you see here, this is normal, this is pre-diabetic, and this is diabetic. And what we're seeing is that intermediate risk is probably playing a major role in these early events, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, so that's one bucket of, infl of, of risk that we address and test for, and I'll t tell you how we treat it at the end here. Um, the second bucket of risk is something called inflammation. And we could check 30, 40 different inflammatory markers. And there are some centers that when they screen patients, they just do a shotgun approach and they will check 40 different inflammatory markers. But the problem is you really need to choose ones that are linked directly to heart disease, that are prevalent in South Asians. And what we've done in Sathi Clinic is we now then whittle that down to only those that also, if they're abnormal, there's something we can do about it. And these are two examples right here on the screen. LP little a, or lipoprotein A, and apolipoprotein B100, or ApoB. Um, you can see kind of what they are. LDL, which is you've heard of before, is bad cholesterol. ApoB sits on top of it. Um, and it also sits on top of LP little a. Uh, and it helps to kind of shuttle some of these particles into plaque and help plaque grow. Um, LP little a looks like LDL, but it actually is a very different species of lipid particle. It's an inflammatory protein as well, and it can promote small vessel clot formation, and we believe is playing an outsized role in the risk of South Asians having heart, heart attacks. And I'll explain how we're looking into that now. Um, so these are the kind of two culprits that are rarely tested for in the general population, but every patient in Sathi gets this te tested at least once. LP little a is genetically mediated. ApoB, there is some genetic linkage to how much you have in relation to LDL, but it largely tracks with your bad cholesterol levels up and down. Now the good news is that we can actually treat this. If we lower LDL in a patient, we can lower ApoB. Um, but with LP little a, it's genetic, and if we try to lower LDL, we will still have high levels of LP little a. But right now, we're testing new treatments that can specifically lower LP little a that will read out probably next year sometime. And so there is a lot of hope on the horizon for the South Asian population, and I'll explain why when you see the impact of these two risk factors. So LP little a, <clears throat> if you have high levels of LP little a, again, a genetically mediated uh, risk factor and elevation. Your risk of having a heart attack on average goes up by about two to two and a half fold compared to baseline. Um, that's MACE events or stroke, heart attack, cardiovascular death, right? So you're seeing big jumps as the LP little a goes up compared to your baseline reference levels. Um, but not as much as it does when ApoB goes up. If your ApoB level is high, your risk can go up sixfold. And so that sounds like a lot, and it is. If you compare that to diabetes, which everyone thinks is a big risk factor, and it is a big risk factor for heart disease, your risk factor goes up by 1.8-fold. We're talking about now 2.5 for LP little a and 6-fold for ApoB. These are much more potent risk factors in many cases than all other risk factors combined and yet no one's checking for them routinely in South Asians. So we've started to do that from the very beginning of Sathi. Back in 2014, when we launched the clinic, we started checking for LP little a, checking for ApoB. Now the prevalence of elevated LP little a levels is dramatic in South Asians. The median value of LP little a is about 40% higher than the upper limit of normal for LP little a. So at baseline, we as South Asians have a genetic predisposition to have high inflammatory levels. Uh, this is similarly true with ApoB, but the good news with ApoB is we can actually lower it. With LP little a, we're waiting for that treatment, but it does impact how aggressive we are with our treatments. And so Sathi has really been thinking about this for a while, because if you're sitting here in the audience right now and you've never heard this before, you're probably somewhat depressed. And you're saying, I'm South Asian, what can I possibly do to help lower my risk? And really, sometimes 
when I was thinking about this in 2014, we said you have to kind of forge your own path through the data. And it's I've been inspired by this woman on the subway <laughs> who, who found a way to not fall over on the subway and use this plunger <laughs> to stabilize herself. And we've really tried a similar approach to kind of cobble our way to remaining under control and in control of our sort of destiny in the cardiovascular space. We started the Stanford South Asian Translational Heart Initiative in 2014 to do personalized risk reduction. And really the way it's set up is a six-month program, and I'll explain what CardioClick is in a moment. Um, a six-month program that actually has two to three physician visits, two to three dietitian and lifestyle intervention visits with baseline and follow-up labs, and we're doing that non-traditional risk assessment. Um, about three years into the clinic, we started to see some plateauing of our impact in patients. They weren't really coming into their visits every time. They were missing one or two of the doctor visits, sometimes two to three of the dietitian visits, and they weren't getting better. They weren't reducing their risk. We were only converting patients to a lower risk level 40 to 50% of the time, and that wasn't good enough for me. So in 2017, we realized through surveys and just observation that patients just didn't want to commute. Many of them are young, professional. They didn't want to leave their parking spot at Google. They really didn't want to come in person that many times in a six-month period. Not unreasonable. So I launched CardioClick at that time, which is a fully virtual form of the Sathi Clinic. Uh, we actually started it for return visits initially, and when the pandemic started, that was the model that Stanford Healthcare used across the enterprise to actually virtualize care when everyone was in lockdown. They used the CardioClick model. It's been wildly su successful, as you'll see, um, in terms of getting patients to engage. And I have Vijaya here to thank for her Nest program, which is the lifestyle program that has been so successful, even in the virtual space of telemedicine, of getting patients to goal. So we'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. Um, so what is Sati? Uh, Sathi is a targeted heart risk assessment program to move the needle on this epidemic. We start by checking these non-traditional risk factors. I mentioned uh, the glucose tolerance testing, the inflammatory panels. We also do particle sizing of lipids because not all LDL is bad, not all HDL is good, but we tend to have bad proportions of each as South Asians and we need to know what our natural set points are. So we use these non-traditional risk factors along with the traditional stuff, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, obesity that you've all heard of, um, <clears throat> to actually craft an actionable plan. We do an adjusted risk score for patients that we think captures the rest of that curve that you saw, that difference in, in predicted versus actual event rates. We actually create our own risk score that trues that up to what we think is actually going to happen to our patients. And we have our own algorithms to combine the non-traditional and traditional risk into an actionable treatment plan. That, that includes always diet and lifestyle treatment in terms of recommendations for changing one's diet. This might be lower carb intake, caloric intake, intermittent fasting. It could be increased protein intake. And it might include a specific type of exercise like resistance training in proportion to cardio that we think is going to be better tailored for that individual patient. It also includes medical therapy decisions. As I mentioned, apoprotein B can raise your risk by 600%, sixfold, right? Whereas diabetes might only be an 80% increase. But if someone has a normal LDL, normal cholesterol panel, which most of our patients do, but their ApoB is off the chart, we will actually treat them with a statin to lower their ApoB because we don't care about the LDL. We'll treat through the LDL to the ApoB because we know it's going to come down. And so we are more aggressive with our medical therapy recommendations than other clinics because we're treating something beyond the traditional. Um, we also have a very low threshold to do stress testing or CT scanning, and we actually started doing more calcium scores. We now have moved to doing more coronary CT scans. In, in Europe, it is actually, in the UK particularly, it's a first-line treatment to get a CT coronary angiogram, which is a non-invasive test, but it gives you the anatomy that you saw in that first patient. 
um, we were able to see through that and sort of create a better representation of whether they actually have disease. Because a lot of these risk factors that you see above are just, they might have disease or they might develop disease. The CT scan is saying, yeah, you do have disease right now and we need to treat you differently or more aggressively based off of that. Still need to focus on those risk factors, but how aggressive are we going to be in managing those risk factors? Right. So that's where we've developed that kind of pattern and sort of care pathways for our patients. So is it working? And the actual answer is yes, it is working. And if you look at our in-person versus our cardiac click, so we, we are doing well in the in-person cohort and the lighter gray bars here in terms of reducing blood pressure, cholesterol, um, hemoglobin A1C does go down, but not that, that much. Um, didn't make a lot of changes in the weight because of that traditional program was kind of losing its power. But with CardioClick, that telemedicine version of Sati, we actually had significantly better results in bringing everyone's risk biomarkers down. Um, this was really gratifying. Uh, we had patients eating healthier in terms of refined grains, fruit, and um, and whole grain, like those patterns were doing the right things for us, increasing their exercise minutes per week. These things really do make a difference. And I can look at a patient's chart from six months ago to today, and I can tell them if they've been compliant with their meds, if they have had a good experience with the diet changes or not, it's all there in the numbers. And actually they are pretty accurate in sort of tracking performance. And we see over 90% of our patients reclassify to a lower risk level in six months, which is really something we're very proud of, very uh, impressive. And I attribute a lot of that to Vijaya's uh, tremendous engagement with our patients, but also that sort of integration with the medical program at Sathi. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize, like, as, as you're looking at this information, like, what should you do? If you haven't been screened for your South Asian specific risk factors, you need to do that. And not just you, but your wife and your husband and potentially your children, depending on their ages and stages of life. Um, if you have a family history, which many of you do, of heart disease or stroke, this is even more important. So getting your family screened, getting yourself screened is the first step. The problem with giving a lot of information is if you don't give guidance of what to do with it, you leave patients in, a, in the lurch, I think. You have to have a clinic that's going to do something with the information and make the information that we're getting actionable. Um, and we do that in Sati, where we're tailoring diet and lifestyle program and medical therapy through algorithms that we've thought sort of deeply around and are always changing, actually. We don't leave it as it is. We kind of think through the newest evidence to bring that to bear here. But we need to be more aggressive in our management of our risk if we're going to sort of match the aggressiveness of the disease. And we have patients who, despite our best efforts, still develop progressive coronary disease because it's that aggressive. But at least we're on top of that, we're managing that actively and preventing that damage-producing heart attack. If they need to get a stent or a bypass surgery, so be it. But that's a better alternative than, than the acute event. So this is kind of where we try to be ahead of that curve. Um, and then lastly, we, we are more aggressive with imaging and the CT scan I mentioned, looking for actual coronary disease will supersede your risk biomarkers every time. They're not perfect in predicting your risk. And so looking for the disease is often something we do. So it's really important to know how aggressive you are and really it gets back to that image of, you know, this is something that can produce anxiety to patients thinking about it, but if you get tested, it can give you peace of mind that this is something that at least is documented. Maybe there's nothing there. Fantastic. And you're doing great. But if there is something there, at least there's something we can do about it. Um, finally, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology are including South Asian ancestry as a risk enhancer for whether someone should consider treatment still not partic particularly prescriptive. It's kind of left to the clinician to do with it what they will, but at least they're thinking about it. I think we need to be more aggressive in getting some of these solutions out into the market. Um, I think uh, Nithya mentioned that I, I have a, a company I started that looks at software to 
use the patient data and the chart to better match them to the right treatments at the right time. And this was really born out of this clinic where I was seeing so many patients who should have had simple risk factors treated, but also non-traditional risk factors tested for at least. And that's something that we should be doing across the board in medicine so that you know patients don't slip through the cracks. And so so that's what we're doing in Sathi and Cardiac Click. And, and I want to just really acknowledge the people who have made this possible. Um, Vijaya certainly and Fahim Abbasi has helped us build our entire metabolic screening program and is really one of the world experts in that space. Shri is a, is a partner in crime with my research program in LP Little A. And, um, and, so, and so on and so forth, leadership down the road. I do want to mention Lata, who has really inspired me to, to start this clinic at Stanford, and I, I have relied on her advice over the many years. Um, and then I want to uh, just highlight that there are two, in addition to Lata, hopefully soon starting uh, seeing patients in our clinic as well, Samir and Rupan are actually going to be onboarded as new cardiologists in the Sathi clinic um, starting actually next month for Samir and, and Rupan in September. So we're really excited to bring even more um, interested uh, cardiologists to, uh, to this effort. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dodge, for an excellent presentation. So we'll enter the Q&A portion of the session for today, and we will start with some of the questions in the chat. So our very first one is, is having low blood pressure a plus or at a higher risk of heart disease if your cholesterol and LDA, LDL and HDL are normal? I, I think that blood pressure almost always lower is going to be better unless you're dizzy and passing out. Um, blood pressure is essentially the resistance against which your heart is working to get blood from where it starts to where it needs to go. So the lower the resistance, the easier it's getting there. So as long as you're not dizzy and weak because of that low blood pressure, which could speak to some other problem that you have, uh, which could be many different kinds of things, uh, as long as you're feeling okay, the lower blood pressure is probably a great thing for you. Great. Moving on to another question. So uh, we actually just received a question in the chat. Um, what is the best um, HDL and LDL markers for South Asians in addition to anything that has already been covered in the talk? So in our clinic, almost every patient gets a goal LDL of less than 100 and often less than 90. And the reason is that the particle sizing changes how we view those totals. Um, if you have a total LDL of, you know, 100, that's great. And it's lower than what is recommended generally for the population. But your particle sizing says that your low particle LDL is off the charts, which it often is in South Asians, sometimes two to three times higher than what is recommended. Uh, to be normal, then your plaque forming uh, form of LDL is, is disproportionately high. And so functionally, that 100 might be a 130 or 140. So we are often shooting lower than 100 in our patients. And hopefully we can get there with lifestyle, but oftentimes we may need some help. And that doesn't have to be a statin. There are lots of non-statin therapies. It could be a plant sterile. It could be, um, you know, red yeast rice. There could be some other type of uh, lifestyle dietary intervention that, that might get you there. But yeah, we are pretty aggressive. So, Great. Thank you, Dr. Lash. Um, moving on to our next question. It was a two-part question, although the first part was generally answered in the talk, but if there's any additional information on that part, um, we would love to get your thoughts. So part one is what should one do if he or she has a high lipoprotein A? And part two is what are your thoughts on simplicity spiral renal uh, denervation? Uh, yeah, renal denervation for mm -hmm. um, hypertension management. Um, so I'll start with that one. And it's it's actually an amazing new sort of approach and, and treatment um, option for hypertensive patients who are refractory to multiple medications. And it, and it can be a real lifesaver truly for those patients because it's such a high risk situation. Um, so I do think that there's a role for that. Nephrology is really the specialty that's going to be the, the key determiner of that in terms of whether that's appropriate for that patient at that stage. 
but we work with our nephrology colleagues pretty closely and, and, you know, they are definitely recommending that. I do think on the horizon that there are treatments that may be really revolutionary for hypertension. And so, uh, they're not that far away, but probably we're looking at four to seven years from now, we're going to start to see these come into the market, hopefully. Um, so I'm excited to kind of see where that goes. Um, the first question, can you remind me? Yes. So the first question is, what should one do if he or she has high lipoprotein A? Um, love, uh, on which you question. address. Yes, yeah, you address. Love that question. Some thoughts so, in the talk. Yeah, it's um, it's a, it's you're gonna hear a lot about if you haven't already a lot about LP little A. I know right now there are at least four large pharma companies developing, um, targeting targeted drugs to lower LP little A specifically. And the first clinical outcomes trial for secondary prevention in patients who have already had heart attacks and strokes will probably read out next year. Um, and that means that actually if it's a positive result, um, I suspect that there will soon be primary prevention trials in the LP little A population, which would be basically 60% of the Sathi population. So we're excited to kind of see what happens here. Uh, separately, we, my, myself and Sri Nalam Shetty are working on building better predictive models of who is likely to have high LP little a and who's likely to have an event. If they have high LP little a, these are things that we need to understand much better, particularly in the South Asian population, but in also in other ethnicities. So if you've had one tested and it's normal, fantastic. And actually, because it's genetic, you probably don't need to have it checked again. Stay tuned on that. Um, if it is high, you don't need to keep checking it. It's going to be high forever unless you get treated for it. But it does come into play on its own. It's not something that we might um, always start medication on. But if it's high enough, it actually has led us to start high-dose statins to lower everything else around it. And so it get, gets back to your physician's comfort level with treating you aggressively based off of that. Um, and, you know, I think that the paradigm is going to shift as we start to get actual treatments that directly impact it. Um, and once we have the trial data to support that, I think you're going to start seeing management be more effective. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, on the topic of Sathi, we actually have a few questions around how can one schedule a screening appointment or an, a visit in the Sathi clinic um, outside of the general referral system? Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, our capacity is going up. Um, as of, sort of next month, we're going to start to have more openings and we're excited because we do have a, a backlog uh, waiting list of patients to be seen. We've never been a big operation. We've been sort of quasi concierge and sort of how we handle our patients, but it's it's um it's time to kind of grow what we're doing and we have some great talented clinicians joining us in this effort soon, as I mentioned. The referral process is uh, still something that you have to go through. Um, even if you have a PPO, you do need a referral from a primary care doctor or any doctor um, that you want to be seen in the Sathi clinic. Um, we take all insurance and, and we um, the only groups that we usually don't get to see are Kaiser because Kaiser won't cover what we're doing. But I think that we're, um, we even see patients who still want to be seen even if they're in Kaiser. But, but I think that that's, that referral really kicks things off. Um, the, way that we sort of work through that list is every patient who does get that referral gets a lab appointment first. And then once those labs are done, that baseline lab set, we have within a week or two of that lab set, their first visits with a Stanford cardiologist and one of our lifestyle interventional team members. Um, and so that starts your six month sort of program. Uh, so that's kind of how it's done, but we still do go through new patient coordinators and they're very familiar with our workflow. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, um, officially what I can say. <laughs> Fantastic. 
So our next question is um, an interesting question from a different angle. So from the provider perspective, what are ways to encourage patients who are at high risk but are apprehensive about starting statin therapy or going through with imaging studies like a CTA? Yeah, great question. Um, so on this topic of statins, you know, you hear and read a lot of the somewhat sensationalized uh, side effects of statins. They, they could cause everything from fatigue and muscle ache to, you know, making you sort of make mistakes on your taxes and things like that. Like uh, crazy things are, get linked to statins all the time. But the truth is, is that not since aspirin have we ever had a medication that has been more effective at preventing heart disease and prolonging life in the number one killer, right? Statins are incredible in that way. Myself, I've been on a statin since I was 30. I had a very strong family history, early heart disease. I've had high cholesterol since I was 16, and it went up the year that I was essentially vegetarian and in the best shape of my life. My cholesterol went up. So I have some genetic predisposition. I've been on one since I was 30. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I believe that they have really helped a lot of patients in the, both the primary and secondary prevention space. So if you do meet criteria to be on one, then I really encourage you to try one. And long-term, we have great data on statins that show that there's not some really looming huge problem. The biggest ones that have crept up, patients say they get muscle ache, and that definitely can happen. Um, it is usually mild and worth that sort of nuisance. And many times, most times, it actually goes away over time. And so, so something to consider. The other one that you hear about in the literature is that, oh, statins may increase your risk of diabetes. There is some truth to that in a very small percentage. But in our clinic, we are obsessive about checking patients for any signal for diabetes because of the other non-traditional risks that I talked about. We're always looking at that. So if we ever see a signal for that, we're on top of it. So, so it's something that you do need to be vigilant, but I would not hesitate to do it. On the CT coronary side, there is radiation. And we don't do it lightly. Uh, particularly if a woman is of childbearing age, we really try not to do it. But it's something that in many cases, it is absolutely the very best test for that patient. We, I'll give you an example where someone might have risk factors and you are setting a LDL target of 100 for them. Um, but you really are basing that off of risk biomarkers, not actual disease assessment. And then you do a CT uh, a calcium score, which is almost very, very negligible radiation, and calcium score is zero or five, and that's not enough for me to do anything more aggressive. But as you saw in that first case, I have many, many cases now, dozens of cases where patients have had zero or very low calcium scores, but their CT coronary showed non-calcified plaque, and it was severe or moderate. And it made me much more aggressive with my clinical management. We're not sure why South Asians may not have the same distribution of calcium score um, to disease. We're not sure if it's even different, but most of the studies in calcium scoring have happened in patients over the age of 40. Um, even the Masala study, which um, a colleague of mine uh, at UCSF Alka Kanaya has done an amazing job looking at, at the migrant population of South Asians in the U.S. and tracking their risk factors and looking at calcium scoring, but it was done in patients over the age of 40. Half of our patients are under the age of 40, so what about them? What are we going to look at, see their calcium scores for? So the CT coronary allows us to see that non-calcified plaque, and it changes our targets. We might change the dose of their statin or start a statin, simply because we saw so much non-calcified plaque that would never have been caught on a calcium score. So, so I know that there is some reticence. The radiation on its own, an isolated CT scan, is really not anywhere close to an unsafe level of radiation. But it's not zero, and I, think, I recognize that. But we advise, if it's needed, that it be done. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dash, for that thorough question. 
an answer. And um, one other question that uh, that was brought up in the chat that I think is a good one to discuss is, what is your recommendation on using continuous glucose monitors to modify lifestyle? Fantastic question. Um, we use them a lot, and we're one of the, probably the biggest prescribers of CGMs in in the pre diabetic space. And so this is usually that's usually the population when we see the insulin and glucose release curves over a two hour period after drinking a 75 gram sugar load, and we see a two hour glucose between 140 and 200, that's a pre-diabetic diagnosis essentially. Um, and sometimes we're starting metformin in those patients. We're pretty aggressive about doing that because they have a very high rate of progression to diabetes in the next three years. But if either way, we do want to understand the triggers for their high blood sugar. And it is very different patient to patient and food type to food type. And so um, you need to understand a little bit more on a personal level, what is your trigger? And it could be a food that you did not expect to raise your blood sugar um, that is actually your biggest problem. So Vijaya is amazing at sort of identifying patients who should get that CGM data, and I, I try to be proactive about that as well, as does Fahim and others in the clinic. And we are able to take that information and make it part of their care plan for that patient to sort of impact maximally their glycemic overload and, and glycemic levels and, and hopefully reverse the prediabetes and insulin resistance. And that's really an opportunity I failed to mention those two conditions are largely reversible with lifestyle. We, we save the medical therapy for those that are in that severe prediabetes range, but mild to moderate prediabetes is lifestyle addressable and fully reversible, in fact. So, so we really want to pay attention to those CGM results. Great. Thank you. Uh, one other question we have is, is it only coronary heart disease or all types of cardiovascular disease that are common issues or more of an issue in South Asians? Um, so there are slightly higher rates of stroke in South Asians, but it's really heavily a coronary disease epidemic that's happening. Um, in 2010, infectious disease, uh, 2009, infectious disease was the number one cause of death in South Asians. In 2010, it became cardiovascular disease, and it's been, you know, a runaway kind of thing for cardiovascular disease since then. Um, but it's largely heart disease. Um, but if you look at East Asian populations, it's reversed. They have higher stroke rates than heart disease rates. Their metabolic disease burden is similar. They have lots of prediabetes and diabetes, but they tend not to have heart disease, they have more cerebrovascular disease. And so we don't understand exactly why one versus the other in terms of the organ systems. But overall, yes, there are higher just general cardiovascular events. Um, other disease states, fatty liver disease that can lead to significant liver problems down the road and NASH is another condition that's pretty prevalent in South Asians and linked to some of the metabolic issues that we see. Insulin resistance plays a big role in high triglyceride levels and fatty liver disease. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, the ultimate mechanism is rooted in insulin resistance and is a major cause of infertility in patients. So, you know, metformin is a, an amazing treatment for those patients and for many of our Sati patients who don't have that severe insulin resistance but have mild to moderate we see really great results with metformin in those patients because um, of the impact it has and sort of taking the edge off of, of those things. So, so those are the ones we focus on, but there are, I'm sure, other conditions that are possibly associated but, or independent of this that, that are prevalent in South Asians that we are seeing. We just don't have the, the time to sort of focus on all of them, but, but yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So we have time for a few more questions. Uh, there are a couple questions in the chat around the merits of the CAC score versus the CTA. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Olka's data from the Masala study showed that this calcium score is tracking nicely with other risk factors 
in South Asians. I don't know that they've linked it to actual heart events in those patients, but again, that population was over the age of 40. Um, and so in our clinic, we're mindful of that. And with our CT coronary testing, we get a calcium score as part of that. But the CT coronary helps us understand if non-calcified plaque is there or not. Now, non-calcified plaque is less mature. It is more likely to be evolving plaque, growing plaque, and that and any dynamic nature of plaque usually makes it more likely to rupture and cause an, an event. So it's higher risk plaque usually. Um, and, and so we really want to see that, but the calcium score is not going to tell us that. The calcium score also is not going to tell us where the calcium is located and if there is a severe blockage in that location. It doesn't give you that image. It's a very much a snapshot of where the calcium is and that's it. Um, generally, we know it's in this vessel, but we don't know if it's 60 or 40 or 90% blocked. Um, that's important information, I, I think, for most patients who have positive calcium scores. Um, so we, we tend to go with the full study if we can get it approved by insurance, which we're more, more able to do with some of the data out of the UK. The UK is always ahead of us in terms of some of the sensibility around testing um, and so I was really pleased to see that they made it first line to do a CT coronary because it's really the heart of the issue. No pun intended, but it's kind of like, okay, do you have disease or not? Okay, great. Now let's focus on your risk factors um, because it changes the, the decision. That's fantastic. So with the time we have left, I'd love to fit in one or two of our pre-submitted questions. So one question um, that would be great to discuss is um, the implications of a vegetarian diet on heart disease in South Asian populations. Yeah, um, vegetarian diet on its own does not necessarily mean a heart healthy diet, right? Um, there's a lot of fried and deep fried and overcooked vegetables in the Indian cuisine, which are incredibly tasty, but not heart healthy. Um, so that's where our clinic in, in Vijaya's sort of program emphasizes the way you prepare the food, not just what you're having. And she does not advocate necessarily for vegan diet, um, but we see that patients on vegan diets do see weight loss and biomarker improvement, but it's very difficult to sustain if you're not sort of someone who's been on that for a long time. Um, and, and so we see a lot of patients revert back. Uh, and so that's something that patient to patient can vary. But the vegetarian diet in general tends to have less fat and um, sometimes has fewer carbs, but you really have to be careful around that. So the metabolic components do seem to improve. Um, and we have many patients who have made that switch or pescatarian or something to that effect. Um, and so we are open to many different models. One thing that we do use a lot of is intermittent fasting. It's something that we feel like definitely just reduces overall caloric intake. Uh, patients seem to be able to do that three to four days a week. Um, and I think it is a good intervention for many patients who have metabolic disease. So. Great. I think we have time to squeeze in one last question, but um, if you have any thoughts, Dr. Dash, on um, alternative medicine forms such as naturopathy or um, Ayurvedic medicine for heart disease in South Asians, um, our audience members would love to hear about that as well. Yeah, we, we do um, have a, a real interest in bringing those philosophies into our care plans. Um, the T in the NEST program is actually standing for for transcendence, which is really around meditation as a form of reducing your inflammatory markers. And there is a clear association of more mindfulness and meditation, yoga, and other sort of more Eastern philosophies being impactful in cardiovascular risk. As far as Ayurvedic medications, we don't prescribe them and we certainly aren't experts in that. But we have seen some impressive and difficult to sort of deny results with some of those approaches in some patients. It's just hard for us to quantify and be 
um, able to give real sort of expectation setting of impact. Like if I give someone a statin, I can actually tell them if they take it every day, you're going to get a 50% reduction in your LDL with this dose and another 20% and a 10% with this increasing escalating doses. I'm unable to do that with Ayurvedic medications and treatments. So while we definitely do not dissuade anyone from doing it and we are supportive of it, we just aren't the experts to tell you all of those things, but we do use some of them, as I mentioned. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dosh, for dedicating your time today for this um, incredible presentation and, and a very um, informative Q&A session as well. So with that, I would like to wrap with just a couple notes for the audience. As Nina has dropped in the chat, the re recording of this talk will be posted on Stanford Care's YouTube in about a week. So please feel free to subscribe to our channel to receive notifications for when this recording is available. And similarly, please feel free to subscribe to our mailing list to receive notifications for future talks. We hope that you enjoyed this event. Thank you all for joining us tonight.